This is the disclaimer for Wildlife Control Consultant and Pest Geek Podcast with Living the Wildlife Podcast. Always follow national, state, provincial, and local laws when using pesticides and or other control methods to manage pests. Wildlife Control Consultant, LLC, Pest Geek Podcast, Living the Wildlife Podcast, Stephen M. Van Tassel, or their or his affiliates are not responsible for followers' use of the information provided here. Hi everyone, Stephen Van Tassel here, Wildlife Control Consultant, bringing you another episode of Living the Wildlife as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. Glad to have you on board, and again, I hope you've had a blessed week and profitable week, and of course, a safe week, because you do have a dangerous job while you're out there. So uh, definitely be careful, but I'm glad you've joined me today. Do take a few moments, if you would, to subscribe to our channel, uh, ring the bell so you're notified of new updates. I tend to publish at least once a week. Uh, I'll probably take a couple of weeks off each year, but uh, that's when when I publish. Uh, once a week and so I deal with the vertebrate side because this is living the wildlife my website is wildlife control consultant but love to have you come and visit if you're looking for some publications and some training and information there is uh, plenty of that here I have some publications that are available for you I'm also always looking to purchase books and materials as well as I'm even looking right now for someone to send me some house mouse scat whether it's been whether it's it was poisoned mouse or unpoisoned mouse i'd like to have both it must be guaranteed to be house mouse i already have scat from paramiscus so i need to be sure that it's mus musculus or mus domesticus depending on which classification you're looking at they're they're the uh, invasive mouse that we have here in the united states definitely reach out to me i'll pay for shipping and pay you for your work but i need some house mouse scat uh, I'm also looking for Norway rat scat for those of you that can grab that as well. So uh, would definitely have you reach out. To me. How do you reach me? Wildlife Control Consultant at gmail.com. Wildlife Control Consultant at gmail.com. So, uh, all right, enough about that. Let's get on with the subject this week. And I thought, uh, I thought I would do something on skunks. And the reason was, is I was kind of. You know, I don't do a lot of posting on Facebook per se. Um, I have been, uh, I kind of lurk a lot and I'm getting into, involved in some other things, but I don't do a lot of posting there. But uh, I did notice that I was actually rather shocked, to be frank with you. Uh, an individual who was having trouble with uh, a skunk in a cage trap. And so, you know, this is part of the problem. Sometimes when you're in the industry as long as I have, um, you know, you don't, you sometimes forget what it's like for someone to be a beginner. And so this was an opportunity from like, well, I, I don't think I've done a podcast on handling skunks. And so I may have talked about some of their biology and some of their behavior, but I don't think I've talked about the handling side of skunks. And what this person was encountering was, uh, a client was calling them up, and of course, like uh, clients do, they put a trap out in their backyard, be- and they think somehow that there's some sort of rule that says only, if you put a trap out for a squirrel, only squirrels go in. And, that, and for some reason, people think, well, that's the only animal that's going to go in. Well, obviously, you know, skunks don't read the sign, and they wander into the trap, and then lo and behold these people have a skunk in a trap. Well, this particular person didn't know uh, how to handle that. And so I thought, well, let me do a podcast on handling special situations with skunks. And so why don't I uh, start with that uh, today? And so we'll talk about talk about that. So let me get my my PowerPoint up here and get that get that started for you. So here we go. All right, well, I'm hoping you're able to see all that pretty well there. Uh, so this is a PowerPoint on skunks. Notice I have the dollar signs here for special and situations because uh, skunks, what I loved about skunks, and I do love skunks, uh, simply because there is plenty of money in skunks and there's no ladders. Uh, one of the things when I was in the field that I got sick and tired of doing I was tired of climbing the ladders. I was tired of hiring that thing around. 
And so uh, what I love skunks is many people, they don't want to be dealing with skunks because obviously they're afraid of the spray. And so let's talk a little bit. I'm not going to spend a lot of time because I think I can do a whole podcast probably on skunk spray, but I just wanted to highlight a couple things here. Skunks can spray in two different ways. They can spray as a as an area spray like a fog or a mist or they can spray as a stream. Think of it if those of you who ever have spitzer bottles, maybe when you're a kid you grabbed one and put water in it, chase your siblings around the house. Well, you can how you adjust the tip tells you whether determines whether you're going to spray a stream or whether you're going to spray like a a whole area. Well, skunks can do the same thing with the way they can, can they can manipulate the sphincters around their two uh, glands. And so they actually, the glands are actually directional. If you're able to see the video here, you know, is that think of it like two little nipples or joysticks and they can direct those joysticks in different directions. So even though they may not be directly facing you uh, from behind, they can still get you from an angle because of how they can do those directionals. I believe it or not, I actually had a juvenile skunk spray me over his head. I still have trouble believing that it happened. If I wasn't there, I wouldn't believe it. Because uh, he was facing me. He was actually staring at me with a head towards me and he sprayed over his back i still try to figure out how he did that because he didn't arch his back it was just weird i and i still to this day uh can't see it so why does this matter well because sometimes you're able to actually see the spray coming towards you and you kind of do the sort of uh Oh, what is the what is that the matrix type move and you just sort of move out of the way and let it pass by you but it is some powerful stuff to be sure. So how far can they spray? Well, the literature is kind of all over the map in my opinion. But I think six to 10 feet would be a reasonable time. Because remember, it's we may not know exactly how far they can spray, but in terms of my experience and just looking at the literature, skunks typically aren't spraying unless you're within that range. Yeah, so even if they could go, I think I've seen some literature that said about to 15 feet, that's a long ways to be spraying something. I mean, think about it. You have us, we have Spitzer bottles in there. Can we spray that out 15 feet? That's pretty hard to do. So, but you have to think about wind and that sort of thing. So uh, that's something to think about. But let's be frank here. And that is, be, wanna be sure you understand that the whole Pepe Le Pew, I'm dating myself. Pepe Le Pew was a cartoon we used to watch as a kid. And it, I don't know if they gets around anymore, but Pepe Le Pew was a skunk and he was always chasing this cat. And the, the joke was, is every time he walked by, people would say, they would smell him. And then they would say skunk and they would start uh, running away and running in horror. Well, skunks don't smell like skunks. They don't like the odor any more than you do. I mean, I used to like it because it was a smell of money, right? But anyways, uh, they don't smell just by walking by. So when you have clients say, well, I think I have a skunk because I smell them. Well, the the skunk they could be smelling is a long ways, could be a long ways away. It could be under a deck. Juveniles tend to spray a lot more frequently. They're a lot more trigger happy than the adults, obviously. Uh, but in, you have to sort of determine, you, the, just because some skunk walks by, don't assume you're going to smell it. They, they don't smell. It's not like it's embedded into their skin or something and they just sort of waft this all the time. They spray it. That's what they're lifting their tail. They don't want to get it on themselves. Uh, females will spray males that they're not interested in, so they don't like it, okay? And it has a little bit of a, a caustic feeling, so it can cause temporary blindness to animals as well. Uh, so the idea is, is that understand that skunk spray, it's not plutonium, it can be treated, you can deodorize, and we may would make it the podcast for a future event here, but understand that there are 
how the, how the skunk shoots is important. It has to come out the business end, but he doesn't have to be directly facing you in in line. He can do it from he can be facing you sideways and still hit you. Okay, so just keep that so just keep that in mind. It's powerful. It's a very powerful odor. It has sort of a yellowish uh, tinge to it. It's marketable. I just saw a price for it. Uh, I think they were paying $18 an ounce. You may say, well, I'm never going to collect it. Well, I, if it's legal in your state, I would encourage you to collect it. I wish I could have collected it when I was in, when I, in my state, but it was illegal unless you did it during the season. I was also living in a very urbanized area. For those of you that are out you know, have a little bit of land around you, I, I would strongly encourage you to collect it because $18 an ounce can really add up after a while. And you can, in some of your larger skunks, you can get an ounce of fluid out of it. So think about it. You charged whatever you charge for your skunk and now you're able to make another 18 bucks out of it. And it's not that hard to collect it if you're just using the syringe method. So that's one way to do it. But it's powerful. It, we can smell it. And again, human human noses aren't that strong. But we can smell it down to 10 parts per billion. So that tells you just how potent this particular odor is. Again, it can irritate the eyes. It can cause nausea with some people. How much of that is psychosomatic? In other words, people just, they, have, they smell this acrid smell. And then they just feel nauseous. Uh, I don't know. Uh, some people who are asthmatics who are breathing it can have some reactions, but again, how much of that is psychosomatic in the sense that it's triggered by an emotional element rather than a real physical element. So think of it like the difference between the sting of a bee. If you're allergic to bees, you're going to have a physical reaction to the venom from that bee, bee sting. But that's different from saying, you know, all of a sudden you're getting an asthmatic attack just because the bee walked. The, the bee flew by. That's a little bit more psychosomatic. It's more in our head. And don't underestimate the power of the brain uh, in terms of our medical condition. So the uh, clients, the bottom line for you is understand clients are highly motivated when they're dealing with skunk smell. And that's something that can add to your bottom line into your profit. So here's the situation. Your client calls you up. I caught a skunk. What are you going to do? Well, I would encourage you to be sure that if they haven't hired you to do uh, skunk work, you need to pay, make them pay for the emergency call and for the removal. So, I mean, this is your opportunity to say, well, you know what, you wanted to do it, do it yourself. You didn't do it right. Then they need to pay. You know, if people want to do this sort of thing, they need to pay. You don't have to make them charge thousands of dollars now, but you do need to make them pay for your emergency call and taking care of this particular job. Because even though we're going to tell you how to do it, it's never 100% sure. I can't guarantee for you that the skunk won't spray you. Animals have their own mind. And we have to be careful whenever we're dealing with wildlife, we have to be careful that word never. Because as soon as you say that, the animal is going to make a liar out of you. Okay, so you want to definitely keep that in mind. What we're going to talk to you about is what the standard procedures are that will significantly reduce and make it highly unlikely that you're going to have a spray incident. But you don't know how nervous that skunk is, how ill that skunk is. Maybe your technique's a little bad. And sometimes things just go wrong. And that's just the way it is. So if you're in a good situation... The, the skunk the skunk trap already has a blind spot and that would be awesome now we're going to talk about what to do when you don't have a blind spot but if you do have a blind spot then you want to approach that cage from the from the side that the skunk can't see you skunks tend not to spray what they can't see now notice how i phrased that i didn't say they couldn't spray what they couldn't see I said they tend, they don't want to spray what they don't see. What they don't see, they often don't perceive as a threat. However, if you pick up a cage trap that, that may be covered and you just shake it radically and you bounce it up and down, that skunk's going to spray because he's feeling frightened for his life. Okay, so 
understand how that works. You're going to approach the trap from the blind side, and you're going to take a cloth blanket, not plastic. You may say, oh, I want to use plastic so it doesn't penetrate. It crinkles. And so this was some advice that I was given uh, from other people, and uh, I, I think it certainly makes a lot of sense. You want to be calm, quiet, not rushing. You don't want to be as slow as molasses, but you don't want to go herky-jerky. You want to be talking to the skunk in, sm in smooth voices. If the skunk is able to see you, if the skunk can't see you, you can approach quietly the trap and then gently put the blanket over the top. Don't just simply throw it and drop it so it has a thud. Simply lay it over quietly, put it in. You want to do everything smooth and quiet, smooth and quiet. No loud noises, no loud bangs, no crinkling. Don't stomp your feet when you're approaching and you're good to go. Okay, and that's basically how you're going to do it there. Then you just gently pick it up and move it and everything should be fine. But even if he does spray, you should be getting, you should have the blanket between you and the skunk. So it would go into the blanket. Okay. Doesn't mean you're not going to have a little bit of residual. Again, this is very powerful stuff. Think of it like cologne or a woman's perfume. You know, a little bit goes a long way. So even if you're in proximity, some of those droplets can get on you that you can't even see. And you may, people may still smell it. Okay. Just recognize that. So that's the easy way to go. Then you're going to dispose of it according to your state your state laws chances are however is your clients not going to have the cage partially covered they're going to have a situation like this where you have skunks in a cage trap with no covering no blind spots whatsoever for you to approach this obviously is a much more difficult situation here is what you have to do you when you arrive you need to assess the situation you have to ask yourself how alert is the skunk how long has the skunk been in the cha in the cage has the client done anything to that skunk to get him more irritated chances are they're not going to be calling you in the morning at eight o'clock they're calling you at two o'clock in the afternoon because they couldn't get a hold of anybody and or they didn't want to pay the price so now you're dealing with a skunk that has been caught in this cage for a long time. You don't know what time it got caught during the night. And he's been in exposed, out vul feeling vulnerable in this cage, out broad daylight all day. And now he may be either sleeping, if you're lucky, or he's awake and agitated because maybe the neighbor's dog has been harassing him or barking at him. Okay. That's going to be a different situation. So what you need to do is you have to go back to that original slide I showed you before. And you're going to approach that skunk with a blanket. Something that's not, you know, a lighter color would be better than a darker color. And you're going to crouch down. You don't want to come at the skunk like you're Godzilla. You want to make a low profile and gently move toward the trap watching the skunk is the skunk looking at you is the skunk turning around is the skunk tamping its front feet you'll hear this and it'll go thump 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 and when you hear that that's the skunk is telling you they're getting angry at you you can stop but do not back up now you say, why don't I back up? Because you don't want the skunk to feel that you're that he's like winning, that he can intimidate you simply by tapping his by stomping his front feet. You're gonna then talk to the skunk. Hi, pretty skunk. Oh, nice skunk. Wonderful skunk. You're very nice. And that makes them a little curious. They may lift up their nose and try to sniff you a little bit, and then just slowly keep working your way toward the trap. In my experience, as limited as it is, what I have found is that rural skunks, skunks that are more out in deeper countryside, are more aggressive than skunks in urban areas. When I've dealt with skunks that are in more, you know, in more country areas, they are much quicker to spray than skunks in urban areas. And I think that's simply because they're more familiar with people, they realize that they've learned that humans aren't as big of a threat. 
so they allow you to get closer before they do anything. And so you can certainly take advantage of that, but watch the skunk, pay attention to the skunk and how that's doing. Now, if you say, Stephen, I just can't do it. Maybe you can't bend, you can't crouch low enough. Maybe you got bad knees or maybe a bad back. There are other ways to handle this situation. That is, you can take the cloth and put it on a long pole and then reach it out there. Like I always carried a, a oh, I think it was a 30 foot extension pole, painter's pole. And then I could do all kinds of crazy stuff with it. Well, you could then take that blanket, put it over the edge of the pole and then stick it out there. So you're gonna be out there 15 feet and then just drape it over one end. Now all of a sudden you have your blind spot. Okay, that's something else for you to consider. If you're dealing with a trap that's a gravity door, then the trap could simply, you could use your long pole to simply tip the trap over onto its back so that the door opens and the skunk leaves. Now, chances are your client won't want to want the skunk around and they probably want you to remove it. However, if you have a situation where your client doesn't care, well, that would be a situation where you could simply turn the tip the trap over onto its back, the door would open and then the skunk would leave when the skunk felt comfortable. Now be careful when you do that. Uh, sometimes when you release a skunk, they'll run into the open garage door. I've, yes, I've had that happen to me. So think about the area. Are there children? Are there pets? Are there people watching? Are there, is, can this go, how can this go bad? And you need to be thinking about that, right? So keep your wits about you. If you're in a situation where uh, the skunk is just so aggressive, it's like it's always turning, it's jerking its hind back towards you, it's threatening to spray. One of the things that you can do, this is a tip from Rob Erickson, uh, who was a major figure in the wildlife control industry back in the, he was a major founder of this industry. Uh, he suggested using a garden hose to distract the skunk. And so basically you're taking the garden hose and you're turning it on and then you create a sort of arc and you make it rain on the skunk. So now the skunk is distracted by the water and not as much by you. And that gives you sometimes enough time and space to where you can then approach the trap and cover it appropriately. He also had some other techniques of injecting the skunk, but that's gonna be a topic for another another podcast. So that is another option for you. You may say, well, Steve, what do I, can I, can I shoot it? Well, uh, if it's legal and safe for you to do so, yes, uh, there, is the, there is the risk that the skunk would spray. If you're using like a traditional firearm, and I'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. All right, so I hope I've taken care of the situation with the, oh, I've caught a skunk in my backyard and that sort of thing. So that's certainly something you need to be aware on how to handle that. What do you do in your situation with window wells? Of course, window wells should always be covered if they're over four inches deep. Many people won't do it because skunks are just simply often running along walls, they're running around at night. They don't see that great, they can see obviously, but they're not like, they're not like owls. <clears throat> and so sometimes they'll just run along and they'll fall into these window wells and become trapped. And one of the situations that happens, of course, people don't know they're there and they can die there. And so then that can be a real bad odor situation. But how do you get the skunk out of this situation? Well, you have several options, and I'm only gonna to talk to you about a couple here. One of them is uh, what I just did here, and I'm not recommending it as the method, and that is what we call a cowboy it. And that is you simply grab it with some cat tongs, gently but firmly, pick it up out of there, and put it on the ground. Can the skunk spray you? Oh yeah. Did I get lucky in that situation? Yes, I did. It didn't occur to me to just put a trap down into it, but uh, you can certainly lower a trap into that particular area, provided the area is large enough for you. And if you cover your trap, 
the skunk will want to enter it because it's going to be a dark space where it's going to feel safer. And it requires a little bit more patience, but you can do it. You can also get a spitzer bottle and try to encourage the skunk to move into the trap faster to get away from the water. But again, you have to read the skunk. You have to learn how to read its body language. Is it looking irritated? Does it look angry? Does it look like it's going to spray? Is it stomping its front feet? Is it gesturing with its hind quarters like it's going to spray in your direction? You've got to learn how to paint. I don't know how to teach that to you. You can have to, other than you're just going to have to learn it as you go, recognizing that when, when the skunk is moving his backside towards you, that's a bad sign. When he's pounding the front with his front feet, that's a bad sign. And it'll be quite loud. It'll be thump, 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 thump. That's telling you he's mad, right? The same way like Canada geese, they pump their necks, right? That's telling you the Canada, Canada goose is telling you, hey, I'm getting a little pissed off here, so you better be careful. Some people think about, should we create a ramp? Well, um, you can see the window, uh, the, uh, the window screen that someone tried to use. I think that is a ramp there in the top photo. Well, it didn't work, right? And then another person has a board here, and they have cleats on it, something that the skunk can grip. Striped skunks are not the greatest climbers. So my suggestion to you, I've never had, I've never had them work. I haven't tried it very often but I haven't worked it. And I'm not really sure I've met anyone who said, yeah, they, they, it was awesome for them. I've had people who said they've tried it and maybe had some success, but it's not really. Part of it, the angle of the ramp they, is suggested to be less than 45 degree angle. So if you have 90 degree angle like this, it would have to be less than this. So somewhere down here. And generally you can't get the ramp to, to work that way because your window wells are too steep. Plus, the skunk has to be healthy enough to climb to begin with. You don't know how long the skunk has been in there. Maybe if the skunk was in there for three days and it's been hot and dry, how well, how close to death is the skunk anyways? Because he hasn't been able to get water. Maybe he had warm days, cold nights. So one of the suggestions is in terms of creating, who wants to carry a ramp in their truck? One of the suggestions, this is from the late LaPierre. Kirk LaPierre, he suggests you take two pieces of plywood, not plywood, two two by fours, you could use plywood as well, and basically take some quarter inch hardware cloth and staple it, and the, the skunks can grip the quarter inch hardware cloth, and then just lower that down. So that's an option. I've never used that particular technique, but I'm just making you aware of it. And so those are some ways you can get the skunk out of that window well. How about situations where the skunk has been caught into the Yoplait containers? Yoplait container, you'll notice it has a narrow neck at the top and it's wider at the bottom. Skunks like the fat and the yogurt and they get their head stuck in there and all of a sudden you have a skunk wandering around and it's really cruel. We need to try to rescue the skunk from our trash. I mean, it's just not right. But obviously you don't want to get bit, you don't want to get sprayed. And so you need, to, how do you do this? Well, uh, this, what you're gonna do and again, you're making sure you're wearing your PPE. You want some good gloves with you. You want to be sure you have a good blanket with you. Now here, the skunk doesn't know where you are, right? The skunk can't see because his head's stuck in there. So the skunk is pretty occupied with this Yo Play container. He can't get it off his head. So what you're going to do is you're going to quick, got to move quickly but firmly. You're going to move up to the skunk, cover the skunk with a blanket, hold the skunk in place. Over the, with your hands over the blanket, you're gonna quickly grasp the skunk and you're gonna grasp the Yo Play container and pull them apart. Again, it requires the balance between firmness without being harsh, but not being so delicate that you're irritating them because you're touching them so much. It needs to be smooth. We need to be firm without causing pain and moving quickly. Uh, I can't teach you that on a podcast. It's something you just have to do and go with the feel of it, okay? And, and what you're gonna do is once you feel it's released, you're just gonna walk away 
And if you want, you can pull the blanket with you. My suggestion would be to probably just leave the blanket in place, let the skunk walk out from underneath the blanket and walk off and, and pick up the blanket when the skunk is away. But you also want to make sure you're keeping dogs and children and people away. The skunk is going to feel very vulnerable at this point. And so you're going to be sure to be thinking about that. Skunks, like any mammal, can carry rabies and other diseases, of course. And so you always want to be thinking about, are there been exposures? Has anyone been exposed? Has a dog been exposed? Now, there's no evidence to date that I am aware of, of skunk essence causing rabies. But when you're in situations with a dog having a tussle with a skunk and the skunk been sprayed, you don't know if the skunk was able to bite the dog. And people often get wound up on the odor of the dog rather than thinking about, did the dog get bit? And so that creates another uh, difficult scenario. So you need to be thinking about some of these challenges before you encounter them, making sure you know how to get a hold of uh, your health department, how to deal with the rabies protocols in your state and get that all worked out before you're in a crisis situation. I talked earlier about shooting. Can you shoot? Well, if it's legal and safe and appropriate for you to shoot, sure you can shoot skunks. If, but if you're using a firearm, it's believed that it's the crack of the gun that causes the skunk to spook and then spray. So the theory is, is that by using an air rifle with a lower report that the skunk doesn't hear the crack and therefore is less likely to spray. Uh, so don't think if you, you know if I shoot it in the head it, it's not going to spray not true if I shoot it in the chest it's not going to spray it not true it seems to be the firearm rather than the location of where you're shooting that causes it to spray and the one person that I got my information from I'm going to give you his reference here in a few in a minute uh, he claims that he's able to get 80% success of skunk not spraying. You say, well, how would he know that? Because he traps skunks deliberately to gather the, the skunk essence because skunk essence is worth more than the pelt of the skunk, which is, of course, very, very sad, but uh, understandable indeed. And so he's shot a lot of skunks and he's got it kind of dialed in. So here's some resources for you if you want to learn more. I know people don't read as much today, but that's unfortunate. These are not long books. The one on the left is actually a video, and the one on the right is a book. I don't know how to pronounce this gentleman's name, so I'm just going to call him Lessel. Uh, he, is a, he is a trapper who, who, uh, who traps the skunks deliberately to gather their essence, and he uses, uh, he uses the air rifle to do it. Bob Noonan was the former editor of Wildlife Control Technology Magazine. Uh, he is basically one of the godfathers in the fur and in the earlier stages of the wildlife control industry. And uh, so he's, he's retired, I believe, now, and he's, he's, uh, he's been out there. But anyways, he published a book on odorless skunk removal where he talks about various things about you know how to transfer skunks and how to handle them in cages and this sort of thing and he can go into some greater detail and again expand your repertoire you know there's not necessarily a best way to do something and we have to sometimes recognize is that different parts of the country different uh, locations different structures, different habitats, animals behave a little bit differently and sometimes a technique that works great in one area doesn't work all that great in another area. Or by learning about techniques in other parts of the country, you may get a little tip to adapt for your area and give you another tool in your toolbox, right? Just think of it like a set of ratchets. Uh, one ratchet doesn't fit all. Right, so you need to be kind of mixing things up and seeing if there's other ways of doing it and, and learning again some of those fundamentals. Uh, another book that I'm certainly going to uh, suggest, and let me uh, pull pull it up here. Um, this is going to be the one from Rob Erickson, uh, Innovative Skunk Control. This is certainly a book. It was published in 2005. Again, I'm sure, although I haven't looked, you don't pay $126 for it. I don't know what these people do on Amazon sometimes. Uh, one of my books, in fact, got 
uh, my second edition of the wildlife damage inspection handbook was someone was charging um, I think a couple hundred dollars for it if memory serves and that's just ridiculous and I and I had the third edition out at that time so I had to put in a, a comment in don't don't buy this I have the third edition and it was like half the cost <laughs> so I mean don't do that but anyways this is another book uh, that I would certainly suggest that would be informative for you and again they're not that expensive typically they're 12 to 20 bucks and they're not heavy reads you can read them very very quickly I know everyone's in the videos today and I think there's there's value in videos but there's also something to be said about having something in paper and reading it about apprehension and how quickly and you're able to reflect on it because you're able to use the videotape of the mind and I think we're losing some of that in our country but uh, again I, I digress so that is certainly those are certainly three resources that you should be thinking about purchasing and then of course I hope you'd consider my book I do have a whole section on on skunk trapping and I think that would certainly be something valuable for you and I hope you're able to pick it up. You can get it from my website, Wildlife Control Consultant, or you can get it from lulu.com or you can even get it from amazon.com or some of our uh, trapping supply. There's at least one trapping supply company that carries my book. So uh, check it out. We're happy to sell it to you again. I think it's about $25 in third edition. Make sure you get the third edition revised because it's a lot bigger from my second one. Well, I hope you've enjoyed that. If you're having trouble with skunks, skunks are very profitable. They're very easy to handle, but you got to be careful and understand the fundamentals. And I hope I've given you some of those fundamentals here that are going to be useful for you. I'm Stephen Van Tassel. You've been listening to Living the Wildlife as part of the Pest Geek podcast family. Do hope you take a few moments of your time. Drop me a note at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com, wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. Would love to hear from you, hear your thoughts and ideas about future shows. Also, if you have a product, a book, a video, maybe you want to talk about your company or the industry, perhaps you have a new invention you're coming out with, I would love to have you on the show to interview you and get that word out. I'm passionate about bringing new products to the market. Again, there's no charge for that. Be happy to do that as part of the part of my work as the Pest Geek Podcast. So again, this is Living the Wildlife. And why do we call it Living the Wildlife? Because we want you to live the wildlife, not be the wildlife. Take care, everybody.